Welcome everybody. Glad to have you with us today. You are with PLMA for a load management dialogue webinar. My name is Judy Knight. I work as PLMA's Chief Development Officer and our load management dialogues allow the opportunity to discover practitioner perspectives on flexible load management, demand response, distributed energy resources and managed charging. Today is a very interesting session. It's long anticipated and it's very topical. It will be presented by Rocky Mountain Power and it will be about their WattSmart battery DR program. Our discussion leader today is Meg Campbell of Guidehouse and Meg is also one of the awards co-chairs at PLMA. And now it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to Meg so she can get us started with some introductions and to tell you a little bit about this award and then we'll get uh, started officially. So welcome to the floor, Meg. Thanks, Judy. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce our uh, speakers for today. Um, we'll be hearing from Sean Grant and Blake Rachetta. So I'll go ahead and quickly introduce them before we talk about um, Rocky Mountain Power's Watt Smart Battery Program. Um, Sean Grant is the Senior Customer Solutions Program Manager for Rocky Mountain Power um, and helped work on developing the Watt Smart Battery Program with Blake Rachetta, who is the Chairman and CEO of Sonnen, um, which is a leader in home battery solutions. So we'll hear more about that today as we dive in. All right now, um, I'll. Uh, start off by just quickly introducing um, the PLMA Technology Pioneer Award, um, explaining a little bit about what that is. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Rocky Mountain Power's Watt Smart Battery Program, which was awarded a PLMA Technology Pioneer Award. And the Technology Pioneer Award is, is one of three primary PLMA awards. Um, the award recognizes programs with innovative technology um, to develop solutions that are really paving the way to effectively manage load and support the integration of distributed energy resources. Um, so Rocky Mountain Power's Watt Smart Battery Program won the award for being really the first of its kind solution for customers to use batteries to turn intermittent solar into a managed smart grid asset. Um, so today we're going to talk more about that and uh, hear more from Sean and Blake. With that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Sean. Okay, thanks, Meg. Meg, can you hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Yeah. Okay, because we had a little tech check just before this meeting and I got back to my desk and my tech check had failed. And so... I lost communication, so I was frantically dialing in after this already started. So I think I'm on here good. So apologize if there's any miscommunication on on how I'm speaking. Just let me know if there is or if there isn't, and I'll try to reconnect. So apologize for that. So yeah, we're we're really excited to be able to talk um, about our Watt Smart Battery Program. And you know, Rocky Mountain Power was honored to receive you know this technology award. Um, from Pioneer, you know, Technology Pioneer Award from PLMA. It really means a lot coming from PLMA since they've always been such a leader in demand response and innovation. And to be recognized by this organization really means a lot. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit our, about our experience with the Watt Smart Battery Program. But before I get into the specifics on it, I have a few things that I'd like to touch base with about what Rocky Mountain Power is doing and why we're or innovating behind the meter storage. Um, and just give a brief overview of Rocky Mountain Power as a company and some of the specific things that we're doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So as you can tell from this visual, Rocky Mountain Power has a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 100% by 2020. And we refer to that plan as destination zero. We feel like it's important to have a plan before we set out a lofty goal. And to kind of um, emphasize a few things within this plan, as noted here, you know, we're planning to retire coal plants. We'll be adding, you know, 9,000 megawatts of renewable energy, of new renewable energy, let me emphasize that and that we're implementing 6,000 megawatts of storage resources, and we're building an advanced nuclear power plant um, 
you know, up here in Wyoming and we'll be, you know, expanding our demand response program and our energy efficiency programs. You know, these goals are significant and we're we're also committed to this energy energy transition while keeping customer rates lower. And um, as you may or may not be aware, Rocky Mountain Power has some of the lowest energy prices in the nation. And on average, our electricity rates are 45% lower than the national average. So we have aggressive goals to transition to renewable energy future while keeping rates low and keeping you know, programs that our customers want. So Meg, if you can go to the next slide. And again, just to just to show a visual of Rocky Mountain Power's um, service territory. You know, Rocky Mountain Power operates in in Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. Um, you know, the the darker shaded area is the area that we serve. So we serve basically 80% of the state of Utah, 90% of the population. The majority of the population where Wyoming lives, where customers live in Wyoming, and then the eastern portion of, of Idaho. Um, but again, talking about renewable energy, so this highlights some of the projects that, that currently are in service and then demonstrates where we're going to put other resources in place. And um, you know, as part of having renewable energy, it's it's important that we have storage resources because even though as as warm and sunny as it is in in southern Utah, the sun doesn't always shine, and you know, in Wyoming, um, you know, the wind always doesn't blow. If you've ever been to Wyoming, you may question that, but the wind does stop blowing in in Wyoming. And so, as we transition to renewable energy future. It's important that we have storage resources battery to be able to, you know, harness the wind and the solar so that we can use it, you know, when when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining to satisfy the, the needs of the grid. And um, so so I just thought it was important to kind of show out some of these these areas to help you guys have a better understanding of what Rocky Mountain Power is doing and the commitment that we have to a renewable energy future. So in the next slides here, I'll kind of transition over to to Blake from Sonin, and he can talk a little bit about the the history and the background, you know, of how Watt Smart project came to be. He'll touch a little bit on 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 Soleil and about the relationship between, you know, a, a solar contractor, a developer, a utility, and a battery manufacturer. So, Blake. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for coming to this important event and thank you PLMA for being such a forward thinking organization and putting this on and framing this in the way that you have. It's just terrific. I can't say enough about what Watsmart is, what Watsmart continues to grow into and the origins of Watsmart in the project that you see on the screen right now, which is called Soleil Lofts. It's extremely special. For those of you who don't know, Sonin is very proud to be the largest virtual power plant for behind the meter residential batteries in the European Union. So we are a European company, a German company. We've been doing this for quite some time in residential storage terms. It's like ancient history. So we've been dispatching swarms of batteries in networks for authentic grid services since 2014, which is really quite a long time ago. And with about 144,000 batteries in Germany being dispatched, and I can tell you right now unequivocally that in the United States, there is nothing that is, in our opinion, as oppressive as what Rocky Mountain Power has achieved. And in fact, in some ways, we've even in the US with Rocky Mountain Power gone beyond what we've achieved in Europe, which is really special. And like Sean said, doing it with continuously low electricity rates in Germany, this is not the case rates went up because of a lot of things, but certainly the renewable energy revolution and the, what they call the Energiewende caused electricity rates to go up. And Rocky Mountain Power did this so intelligently and so dynamically that they were able to keep rates down or even lower. The other thing that Rocky Mountain Power did that's so special to me is the speed behind how they were able to make all this work. We know of a lot of pilots and a lot of programs across the country with the limited number of batteries, limited number of participants or geographies, or even more importantly, 
the application for actual grid services is being dispatched only a few times a year. And maybe there's a bunch of middle layers that are required of software just to make that work. And there's nothing wrong with those things. It's simply the case that for Rocky Mountain Power to go from Soleil Lofts, which is what you see here, this one incredible apartment community of 600 apartments, to a utility scale service territory wide program in less than a year and get that through the Public Service Commission of Utah and now have thousands of batteries being dispatched every day for eight grid services. This is really special. So I think the key of what you're seeing here is the whole story, but to really summarize it as Meg and Sean really also already summarized or framed up, we're talking about taking intermittent and even erratic renewable energy generation that we need and we love and as environmentalists, myself even, we believe in and we are trying to harness that renewable energy and actually harmonize it with grid operations to create a true and genuine energy transition. And at the same time, deal with the extremely, as PLMA knows very well, difficult challenge of electrification of load and having that proper harmonized and soft load shape. And to do this for not just DERs being included, but for all loads and to build that distributed and decentralized and digitalized grid of the future. And so if you're going to do that, or if that's your objective, I don't know of a better way to do it than what Rocky Mountain Power has done. And now they see that with every day dispatching the battery and or many, many batteries. So the key of this slide is really about partnerships, as Sean alluded to. So Rocky Mountain Power went about it maybe a different way than many. Instead of making a huge, let's call it administrative and programmatic to do, and even a huge, let's call it regulatory to do, they used the right channels. They partnered with Wasatch Group, an innovative leader in Utah of building apartment communities and buildings and commercial office spaces. This company wanted to do this. They wanted to do something pioneering. They wanted to use their new Sole Lofts community as the first of its kind in the world. And Rocky Mountain Power simply embraced it and then moved really fast. And then after that was successful, moved beyond that. So this slide shows that this was a 600 unit apartment complex known as a genuine breakthrough in the clean energy industry. It was the first of its kind for world, for real, a utility controlled all electric solar battery VPP where every single apartment has a battery in it and Rocky Mountain Power controls that battery every single day. And that partnership was key. And then they expanded that partnership just from Wasatch, which was the developer of this apartment community to the whole industry around Utah, multiple industries, building, residential, and solar, which is really cool. So the next slide goes into really that ultimate, well, this is more on Soleil Lofts. I think Sean will actually have slides on the ultimate Watsmart. So Soleil Lofts, four and a half megawatts, 12 and a half megawatt hours. And yes, it's being dispatched on a regular basis, bringing authentic value to the grid. And this is really important. I mean, we're talking capacity. We're talking energy. We're talking resource adequacy. We're talking frequency response. We're talking having the ability to look locally and understand what's going on at the substation level based on having granular control of batteries. We really have multiple layers of demand response that Rocky Mountain Power has innovated through the program. And even as it pertains to energy products and being able to mitigate the usage of peaking power plants, this, in theory, gives Rocky Mountain Power the mechanism to do that so that they can transition their grid to what Sean was talking about, the decarbonized grid with the nuclear power base generation. And it's just really special. So this really shows the, I think, the strength of the Solilofs project. I'll conclude by simply saying that in this final stage, which Sean will go over the Watsmart program where he took it, they took it from one apartment community to an entire service territory wide program and became the largest directly dispatched battery network of behind the meter batteries in the country from a utility that's dispatched every day for real grid services. But to do that, they really needed to, to work on the partnership side. And can you believe we have solar contractors, residential solar contractors who typically are not very positive about a lot of 
interaction sometimes with utilities. The opposite in Utah, they feel that they are what smart partners and they are working directly with Rocky Mountain Power to make this dream into a reality. So I think it's very special. I'd like to give the floor back to Mr. Sean. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Blake. And you can go to the next slide, Meg. Um, and so just to touch a little bit more and elaborate on some of the grid services that were being provided. And as Blake mentioned, you know, we, we started this Soleil project. Um, many of you have probably heard of it or read about it. It was the Utility Dive Project of 2020. And so we first started doing the batteries. I think the first batteries came online in 2019. We, we um, you know, the concept worked. We leveraged that into a larger program and we started the Watt Smart Battery Program. We received regulatory approval in um, Q4 of 2020. So we went from the Soleil lofts to the Watt Smart Program in, in just over a year. And then now we have a program in Utah, we have a program in Idaho, and we expect to have a program in um, coming years in our Wyoming service territory. So the lessons learned from the from the Soleil project, from the meat of the batteries have been leveraged into a larger program. And so now I can touch base on on a couple of those grid services that we're providing. You know, Blake mentioned that we're doing eight on a daily basis. I'll, I'll emphasize a couple of them here. So we use the batteries for traditional demand response. One thing that's unique about the batteries and how we can use them, um, what we refer to on a daily basis is we're using these batteries and customers are using these batteries every single day. So we're in, a, in essence having demand response events 365 days a year. So that's kind of unheard of when you talk about um, demand response programs, but we're using it every single every single day. It has extremely high customer satisfaction. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, we've only had, to my knowledge, we've only had one customer ever opt out of the program, and we have thousands participating. So customers like the program. It benefits the utility. It benefits the customer. Um, and, you know, we're, we're also using it for, like we're referred to as distribution site level frequency response. And we have, um, and so to maybe elaborate on what that means is we use the batteries every day for a frequency response reserve. And to be able to do that, the batteries have to respond to, I guess, grid signals autonomously and they have to be able to respond real time, which is within, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. So if there's a frequency issue that happens on the Western grid, these batteries can respond instantaneously to help with, with that grid situation. We also can use it for local distribution and feeder substations to reduce peak. And then, um, you know, most importantly, it's a customer partnership. You know, customers are installing rooftop solar. They're installing batteries. You know, they like it for the backup power and for the ability to, um, I guess, get the, the full retail cost for energy by, by storing excess energy in their batteries instead of exporting it to the grid and then using it um, to power their houses in the evening. And I have a few graphs here that I can show a little bit more detail on how how it all works. But again, it's it's a program that we're partnering with our customers to innovate for the future. You know, we're, we know that our customers here in our service territory and probably your customers, you know, throughout the United States, that they want to transition to renewable energy future. They want clean energy. They want electrification. And this is how we can partner with our customers. And it, it's been a, it's been a great partnership. So Meg, we'll, we'll go to the next slide, but um, I've noticed that people that generally attend the PLMA groups are, are, are pretty well versed in the industry. So I have a few um, graphs here and I'll, I'll, I'll probably geek out on some of the data and some of the details, but I think you guys will appreciate it. So here's a graphical representation of what happens um, over, over a two day period with with batteries, with load from the grid, and from the solar. So the orange line 
represents what happens to solar on a daily basis. So on the first day, you can see, you know, the sun comes up, the solar is producing, it peaks in the middle of the day, goes down in the evening, and then basically there's no solar production until the next day when the sun comes up. You know, the graphical representation for the second day shows that solar was a little bit sporadic. It never peaked out. It was, you know, in and out at, throughout every hour of the day. And, um, and then we see that that continues to happen. We look at the blue line, represents the load of, you know, the participants in aggregate we can kind of see that it, you know, it peaks out in the, the evening. And one thing that it to notice is that when the solar production drops off, that's when the peak load occurs. And then the yellow line represents what happens with the batteries. So when the battery, when there is not enough solar production to meet the load needs, the batteries make up the difference. And so in essence, when solar production stops, demand is high on the grid, we're able to use the batteries, customers are able to use the batteries so that we're not pulling from the grid. And this is how we have, we use demand response every single day um, in our program and it benefits the customers. And you can see the yellow line as it's, it's going down below zero. That means that excess Solar production is being used to recharge the batteries. So the batteries are recharged every day. They're used to power the house. They get down to a, a reserve percentage, and then we do that cycle over and over each day. So Meg, if you want to go to the next slide, this is just a little bit more detail, um, but I think this shows a three-day period. But again, solar is, is sporadic. Um, you know, batteries are being used to power the home, reduce the load from the grid. Uh, batteries are recharging on a daily basis with that excess solar. And then if you can see that, that um, vertical yellow line at about you know, 2,300 hours, yep, right there on the first day, that's when we actually had a, a frequency event. So the batteries respond real time. They provide that grid need. And then, you know, we just, we do the cycle over and over again. Batteries are always available for backup power. They're always available for grid emergencies, and they're there to power, you know, customers' houses. So it's really, really a win-win situation for the utility and for the customers. Um, you know, we can see that the batteries recharge every day. They they go down to a a, a lower percentage, typically you know twenty to forty percent each day, and then we we um do that cycle over and over again so our last concluding slide that we have here is a video so Blake and I have been talking about this program and you know it it may make sense to a lot of you and you're like oh that's really cool but you know we could talk for for hours but this video is going to explain you know how it works it seems very futuristic this video, but it's not. No. How this video portrays batteries is how we're using those batteries every day and how we've been using them every day for a couple of years. So, Rich, if you want to play the video, then we'll we'll pause after that and, and go to for questions. Power on. Power on to the buoy. 240. Breaker on. Battery grid on. First inverter on. Sending power to inverter auxiliary. Battery micro grid on. Everything good? Battery backup live. Solar production.
on the control center. Close, check close. Circuit breaker 52, Hotel One. Paralleling, Battery Bank, Bravo, Tango, Romeo 3 with grid. Check megawatt flow on Circuit Breaker 52, Hotel One. Heating Battery Bank, Bravo, Tango, Romeo 3 at sunrise. Confirming energy production of 63 megawatts. So yeah, we're really excited Ready about this this program and, and and the batteries and how it's you know helping us innovate with our customers. And we you know we appreciate um, again the recognition from PLMA as recognizing Rocky Mountain Power as a as a technology pioneer. So um, any concluding thoughts, Blake? <clears throat> no, thank you, Sean. I I love the video because it shows again. A few things that are very, very special. You guys actually dispatching a battery network directly from Rocky Mountain Power, directly integrated to your grid operating management system, which is also a first for our country, and doing it every day with thousands of batteries. And it's it's just a really special achievement. So have, let's go to some Q&A. Meg, are you, are you able to switch your microphone back on, please? There you are. Yes, there we go. Terrific. All right. Yeah, now we'll we'll get to the Q&A here. Um, first, want to start off by asking and really understanding from you guys, how were you able to create a scalable battery program where really anyone from the territory can sign up and be a part of the program? Sean, you want to take that, buddy? <laughs> Well, I think it's just all about, um, you know, partnerships, because as as Blake mentioned, you know, we had a relationship with a a battery manufacturer. We had a relationship with a solar contractor. We had an, a developer that wanted to be innovative and do something different. And then we had support from um, the utility commission and the utility in itself. So it it just kind of came together and and it worked and you know since we've leveraged that where we're allowing other batteries to participate in the program there's customer interest you know we have um tens of thousands of customers who have been installing renewable energy um installing a battery was just was a natural thing something they wanted to do and so if we could it we could incentivize and encourage customers to install batteries that interacted with the grid and didn't create problems for the grid you know it was it was a win-win solution by the way he hit on something else very interesting which is another innovation from rocky mountain power that i haven't seen in, at least in this country which is now all the existing solar customers that don't have batteries in utah rocky mountain power is incentivizing even higher amounts of funding for the grid services that the battery produces if someone who already has solar adds a battery. In Europe, it's called firming up the solar. And so the existing solar in Utah that had no battery is now being upgraded to solar and battery. And it's, it's, it's really cool. I guess the only thing I want to add to his answer, because <clears throat> he's very modest, it's very Rocky Mountain Power. I kind of feel like in some ways this is very, it, it's Utah culture and it's Rocky Mountain Power embodying that. They are like, they they don't like, slow they don't like bureaucracy they don't like wasting time and i'm not saying other folks do i'm just saying this is to me this is very utah and they like doing things without creating a lot of extra costs for people and this was an example of utah culture in my opinion at its best they decided they wanted to do it instead of being defensive and again i'm not saying something about any specific utility i'm saying instead of being defensive instead of being you know, how do we make this as slow as possible and have be paralyzed by pilots and processes and lots and lots and lots of, let's call it over analysis paralysis. Rocky Mountain Power simply decided, okay, we have partners, we have a will, we want to innovate, let's go. And, and did it. It's just amazing to me. It just absolutely blew me away for the entire process of building this together with them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. And 
we have quite a few questions here in the chat, so I'm going to kind of categorize them. And I want to first start off by diving more into the technology. We have a few questions really related to that, understanding key successes and challenges. And uh, you know, one question that came up is, um, have there been any issues with the residential batteries deploying energy and causing strain on the grid or transformers? And if so, you know, what's been done to take a look at that and mitigate it? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. It, there hasn't been any issues with it causing strain. It's actually relieved a lot of strain and, you know, relieved pressure. But we do, um, as we're evaluating applications for batteries that come in, you know, we do take the solar and the battery, figure out what the max, max export for the grid is going to be. And we just evaluate it just like we do with 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 solar applications, with regular customer generation application. So it, it hasn't caused any problems. It's it's reduced a lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, think about it this way. This is dispatchable solar. So when we say firming up the solar, Rocky Mountain Power has control over the solar and they've actually evolved, I think, their policies beyond, again, what I've ever seen in this country. I know a few utilities are looking at doing this as well, but not just seeing a battery as a load because it actually isn't, but seeing it as, okay, if we control this, then we're not going to simply allow with intermittent solar, they have no choice. They have to take all the solar whenever it's sunny. The idea here is you're not going to allow that injection. You're going to harness it and you're going to use it against load. Very perfect for PLMA. But then at the same time, Sean can inject, but it's injection when Rocky Mountain Power wants the injection. As an example, we do frequency response regulation up is what we do usually with Rocky Mountain Power. There's injection there, but that injection was injection that they needed at the moment, as opposed to potentially crashing into the grid for the belly of the duck curve and creating strain in the transformer, as you pointed out. So I just wanted to compliment Sean's points and say, oh, one other thing I think is really important. Again, Sean's being modest. Bill Como, one of his colleagues, just informed me yesterday that, or two, they informed me yesterday that they have launched their, hope I can say this, Sean, their battery only WattSmart program. And so now to, to really firm up what we're saying, Rocky Mountain Power will incentivize someone to have battery only to help with grid balancing and to be able to grid charge when there's very little strain on the grid and time shift to offset peak period. And this, of course, is a beautiful idea, also done quite a bit in Europe, but I don't know of any of it in the United States, especially especially because of the way our tax credits used to work prior to the Inflation Reduction Act. So very proud of, wow, Rocky Mountain Power is now incentivizing battery only. I don't know if there's another utility in the country that does that, no solar at all. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing and elaborating that on you guys. That great to hear that it's you know relieving problems. It's a solution and not creating more problems because that's always a concern when thinking about yep. these programs. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, another question that is coming up and also something utilities think about in programs like these is um, what percent of the battery is reserved for the utility use when you dispatch it and how much is saved for the customer to use during those times? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's important because, you know, when customers go to enroll in a program, they sometimes have the misconception like, well, I'm going to enroll my program and then you guys are always going to use it. And then when the power goes out, I'm, there's not going to be anything for me to use. So we set the, what we call the state of charge minimum at 20%. So we won't draw the battery down more than 20%. And in reality, the way that we're using it, we're, we're only using a few percent of that battery on a daily basis, but the customer is using the majority of that battery. Another misconception that they always have is like, well, if the grid goes down, are you going to use my battery and I'm not going to be able to use it? So they, they don't kind of understand that. Well, if the grid's down, we can't use your battery. So that battery will be there for you to use during a power outage. And so it's just important under, to educate customers on how it really works and the benefits of it. And you know that they it's important for them to kind of initiate a uh, energy conservation strategy when the power goes out because with that 20%, you know it'll keep the lights on, run essential circuits for for quite a long time, but if they're 
you know, running their central AC or doing things like that, it's it's going to go down fast. But if they use energy wisely, it can last a long time. And then when the sun comes up the next day, it's going to recharge the battery and they're going to have a full battery if there is an extended outage. Yeah, and I think to complement where Sean's going at, again, same kind of, I think we complement each other in certain ways because he's he was really explaining that very technically. And I just want everybody to realize what he's saying. The backup power reservation is totally different than the self-consumption daily cycle. So a self-consumption daily cycle, the battery just charging against load, that's the problem. And it's still such a young battery market in this country that it's hard, I think, for some folks to get their arms around it. But PLMA is perfect for this because it's about load management. The load shape is valuable to Rocky Mountain Power. It's valuable to the grid. Offsetting peak period, using less power during congested times, more power potentially during uncongested, decongested times, not injecting into the grid. That load shape, that harmonization. But those electrons are being used behind the meter. So the customer's using it for their load every day. Rocky Mountain Power is just optimizing the load shape. And so the grid's getting value, the customer's getting value. And then Sean went into the back of power reservation. Well, that's where Rocky Mountain Power is not doing anything because it's reserved for when the power goes out and the grid loses its power connection. And then, of course, you have at least that much in your battery. And then his final thing he was talking about as far as how little they can use sometimes. Yeah, I mean, when you do a frequency response dispatch and you're injecting back into the grid, this is for a couple of minutes. And so if you the, the lesson learned here is if you structure the program, first of all, which is very difficult, by the way, now we didn't know if it was going to work, but it, it's working where people understand, OK, Rocky Mountain Power gets value by just shaping my load and shaping my solar. OK, I'm getting paid for that, but it's still my energy. And then, by the way, sometimes they're going to use it for these cool things called dynamic grid services, and that'll only be for a small part of the battery. And I still get a reservation in my battery for backup power. So. This is really very important differences in the value stack. And I think Rocky Mountain Power has done just an amazing job with it. Yeah, those are all great points. Thanks for sharing that. And really continuing to talk about the battery. Can you share some of uh, the key requirements for a battery to be enrolled and participate in the program? How did you guys think about that? And can you elaborate? Yeah, that's that's a good question. That's an important question too, because this program isn't only a, a Rocky Mountain Power program with a Sonin battery. Um, you know, at the time when we did this, the Soleil Lofts project, and when we had this concept, there just wasn't a lot of options out there. Truly, there, were, there weren't any, really any options at all. And so we have established some framework. We have it outlined on our website. You know, batteries have to meet certain safety requirements. They have to have certain warranty requirements they have to have a certain cycle life they have to be able to provide um, telemetry in um, near near real time or on a you know five second 30 second basis they have to be able to respond to signals instantaneously so there's a whole list of requirements out there we're and and we're open to having any battery participate in our program if they can meet you know, the safety and functional requirements of the program. And, you know, since we first started the program, we had one battery that was eligible. Now we have four and then we're, we're in conversations with several others to implement them into the program as well. Yeah, but I, and I think what's very interesting about what Sean's talking about, just for everybody's context, is that this is also very unique in the United States. So to have a utility get this granular about, well, is this really a dispatchable battery? Will I have telemetry? Will I have speed of response? Will it be able to do a whole stack of grid services? This isn't, we're gonna give you some money because the Public Utilities Commission thinks we should do a battery demand response thing and we dispatch it for emergency load reduction twice a year. This is the opposite of that, but I will benchmark. I mean, look, I'm a, a proud American, but I work for a German company. Again, in Germany, you see these parameters around safety of the battery cycle life, energy reservoir. It's very intense, especially like in Bavaria. And in America, to be totally frank, it's not quite as intense yet on any of these customer battery programs. Your battery can just be a battery and maybe it only cycles a couple hundred times. Maybe it has tremendous thermal runaway. Maybe it doesn't respond to a demand response for 45 seconds. Doesn't matter. But Rocky Mountain Power took that bar way up and Really, it's been very, very cool to see that it's worked 
and we do have batteries that Sonin and Rocky Mountain Power are dispatching all these non Sonin devices, all these other battery manufacturers products and their rise into the challenge, which is great. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you guys for explaining that. And um, one other thing that's coming up a lot in, in the chat here in questions is um, related to the payback period. So, of course, one thing a utility needs to think about is the cost effectiveness of a program, how to really think about that um, and, you know, financing mechanisms that may be needed to be used as well to get a program like this up and running. So with that, you know, what is the payback period um, for Rocky Mountain Power and the customers and um, were any financing mechanisms used to also get this off the ground and running? Yeah, so there's a couple points to that question and I can touch on them. So, so cost effectiveness um, and then customer payback, those are kind of two, two separate um, mm -hmm. two separate things. One's for the utility, one's for the customer. I'll touch base on the customer experience and then I'll touch base on the utility cost effectiveness. But for, um, you know, the payback period for a, a battery, um, and solar, truthfully, it, it can actually be very challenging. You know, it, it, they don't have short payback periods. Um, and, you know, if, if you're doing a battery and solar for just the payback, you know, it's probably the wrong reason to do it. You know, we're finding that customers want to do it because it's the right thing. They want to contribute to clean air. They want to do renewable energy. And so for those reasons, um you know they're participating yeah we do offer um a pretty significant incentive you know on average our incentives are about about you know two thousand dollars you know customers can get a 30 percent tax credit for their battery so between the utility incentive and the tax credit from the federal government you know it's reducing the cost of the battery about 50 percent so throwing in some of those economics makes it more cost effective for the customer on the payback period but but it's still it's still going to be a long a lot of years out there and then to touch base on the cost effectiveness for the program so we run cost effectiveness tests for the program similar to all the other demand response programs that we offer you know we we run the trc test the the uct all of those standard cost effectiveness and we just value um, the batteries as part of our avoided costs and so they have and I, I won't share what the number is but the value for batteries is is probably it's the highest of any of our demand response programs because it has the most flexibility you know as we as we've talked about we can use it for eight grid conditions every single day and so it has tremendous value. It doesn't need to be hot outside. The air conditioners don't need to be running for us to use that demand response or, you know, the, the lights don't have to be on or the irrigation pumps don't need to be running or, or whatever. We just have that storage resource that can be used, you know, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And so it has it has tremendous value and the program, you know, is 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 very cost effective. From a cost benefit, you know, TRC UCT ratio. That's awesome. Yeah. Blake, did you have anything else to add? Well, I mean, the questions about is there financing and, and support where Sean said, yes, if you're making the decision, look, Rocky Mountain Power is paying you to really have your battery perform, to be empowered to perform at its true potential and get paid for it. Upfront incentive is extremely nice compared to really anything I see in the market. Maybe the old S chip is similar, but then Rocky Mountain Power is paying you an annual dispatch and a bill credit. And this is really special. And then as it pertains to, well, what's the payback? Like Sean said, payback is a tough question when Rocky Mountain Power has electricity rates that are eight cents a kilowatt hour. I mean, this is a really affordable energy. Now, are there mechanisms to help with the financing for homeowners? Of course, most of the folks in Utah that are in WattSmart are using loan mechanisms. So there's, I mean, a lot of people pay cash, but for those who can't afford to pay cash, there are loans and there are leases available 
So both mechanisms to make it so that you can make that that jump. And the solar contractors in Utah that have decided to embrace Rocky Mountain Power and WattSmart, which is pretty cool, are selling those financial instruments as opposed to the old school solar only instruments. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for touching on that as well and, and talking about the little bit about the customer's financing experience too. Now continuing to talk about the customer, um, can you both share um, any feedback you've heard from the customers about their experience with the program and really their willingness and excitement to participate and be in, involved in well? Yeah, so we we have, you know, a lot of, of positive feedback from it. And I'll just share one that I had with a customer a couple hours ago. He called me <laughs> and he was he was he was moving. And so there's kind of a transfer process that when somebody's enrolled and they sell their house and the new customer rolls in and he he simply stated well from my perspective there's no downside to this program <laughs> and so i don't know why anybody wouldn't want to participate so i think that's pretty pretty glowing positive feedback is like from their perspective no downside and everybody should participate so that kind of sums it up yeah it's beautifully said yeah i think the Really, what we've seen with, and again, I got to emphasize this point, typically the residential solar contractor is not necessarily gung-ho uti pro-utility virtual power plant, right? And a lot of times they're skeptical of that and they're talking about grid defection and all this sort of stuff. And in this case, you have certain solar contractors that have really become part of this bigger Rocky Mountain Power vision for grid of the future. And they sell it. And again, I'll, I'll use my European benchmark. It works in Germany to a lesser extent, Italy, a little Belgium, Sweden. But when it comes to the U.S., I, we were not sure if American consumers were going to respond to this message of do something for the community and have clean energy, lower electric bill, and by the way, get backup power. You know, the do something for the community part, the this is for the greater good. We didn't know. And, and it's worked. And so it's really cool to see that you have such a tremendous uptick but to capstone that you have to present this proposition in a certain way is our experience if a solar contractor presents it differently as an example to be totally frank with you if a solar contractor comes to you and says oh you don't want watt smart the utility controls your battery why would you want that why would you want the utility controlling your battery and if you presented it in that negative light then of course people aren't going to buy it but if you present a positive light and positive light for the utility, for the energy system, for society, and for their home, then we've found it to be very successful. Yeah, and that is a good point. You know, customers need to be educated on how it really works. There's a lot of myths out there how they think it works or how they believe it works, but if they have the correct understanding, knowledge of how the program works, then it's just positive experience. You know, customers are telling us, yeah, this makes sense. I can see how this works. I'm excited to participate. Um, yeah, you know, why isn't everybody doing this? Um, so, yeah, it, it it makes sense, and they're they're excited to be part of it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great to hear that you guys have really cracked that code on the education and framing piece, because oftentimes that's the challenge we see with demand response programs. Yes. And if you can't get the customers on board, then you don't have much of a program. Then that's right. And and Meg, it's only certain contractors who've cracked the code. Just so some of them, nope, same problem. But the ones who really like love WattSmart mm -hmm. sell WattSmart. Yeah, and you know, just to emphasize on that a little bit more, one of the the leading or the leading the leading installer <laughs> in the in the state of Utah, they don't of of solar battery. They're just doing exclusively our program. And I don't even know if they'll install a solar only application. If somebody says, hey, I want to just install solar in my house. I think it's very, very rare that they do that because they're like, no, we need to do solar and batteries because this is what helps the grid. And and they can sell those those benefits and the customers, you know, it makes logical sense to them. And then they they want to participate. And by the way, that company, ES Solar, was not the largest before WattSmart. So what just happened? Rocky Mountain Power created a new type of channel for the market in Utah and a new type of contractor. 
So now they're the biggest. They weren't the biggest before WattSmart. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for explaining that. Now, um, just getting to a, a few other questions here, mainly related to um, the use of the battery and and also with demand response events. But what kind of technology do you use to engage with the battery? Uh, yeah. yeah, so we've, we've created what we call a, a grid management battery system. And so it's a it's a portal similar to what other companies are using for other demand response technologies, except there's a few unique things with it, several unique things actually. So we have it fully integrated with Rocky Mountain Power's greater energy management system. So like in that video where you saw the dispatch center and, they, and it showed the batteries as part of what they could do with their their load, we have it integrated so they're getting real-time data. And then our battery management system is providing real-time telemetry on a two-second interval basis. So we're getting real-time data from you know, the solar, the battery, the, the load, all the important metrics on a on a two second interval data. And it's actually, if you look at the portal, you can see the numbers continuously changing. And so we know real time what's available and we have real time response for that. So it helps us make good decisions on the grid and how we can um, you know, utilize it. Yeah, and for us to co-develop this platform, this battery grid management system with Rocky Mountain Power and, and host it both in the US and back in Germany, was such a special experience because, again, there's a lot of stuff that's been achieved in the European Union, but what Rocky Mountain Power wanted to do was actually special. It was different. So we had to put a lot of time, effort, and resources following Sean and Bill's, another guy at Rocky Mountain Power, leader in this, a pioneer, their specifications to build directly into Rocky Mountain Power's grid management system this platform. And then we thought, wow, what did what do we just do? Like the, there's no need, I'm, with all due respect to all software platform pathways, there's no need for, for instance, a DERMS or anything like that when Rocky Mountain Power's system literally directly talks to all the batteries you know, through our software that we developed with them and then back up into Rocky Mountain Power's system within, you know, which is really incredible within two to three seconds. So it's a, yeah, the demand response is their platform, the Rocky Mountain Power WattSmart battery grid management system. That's awesome. Um, great to hear that it was integrated right in and you could develop that solution and then easily tap into it and have that, you know, ongoing feed of results to understand really what's going on with the batteries. It's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, it's special. Yeah. All right. Just scrolling through here, trying to make sure we hit on a lot of these great questions. Um, Skipping back to incentives for just a moment here, there was a question about that $2,000 incentive, which, of course, incentives are a great way to motivate customers. Um, what's the time frame in terms of that incentive? Um, how often do they receive that? What What does the structure of that actually look like? So we give them a $2,000, approximately $2,000 based on the KW size of the battery. But it, on average, the incentive that we give out is $2,000. So they get that incentive upfront when they enroll, when we verify that the battery is functioning properly and communicating. So we'll give it to them as an upfront. They'll get a $2,000 check. And with that, they have a, a four-year commitment period. So they have to commit to participate in the program for four years. If they elect not to, then they need to, they're required to pay back a prorated incentive. Yeah, and by the way, this incentive, which like you said, 2000, there's there's a lot that are 2400, 2600, depending on the size of the battery, of course, as he said. Right. But the bottom line is this incentive is being processed. Again, Sean's too humble to say these things. That's why I'm on, I think, in a couple of days. I am not joking. So there are programs, I won't name them, especially, I hate to say it, but ones that are involved with, uh, with government as well, nothing against government, but 
that the incentive could take nine months to a year to get. Sean is cutting a check to someone in what is it, Sean? Two days after approval or some crazy thing. Yeah, we're we're processing electronic payments where they can essentially get them real time. <laughs> so anyway, it's great. Zero yeah. bureaucracy. The thing that yeah. Phillies are supposed to be bureaucratic, but somehow this one, this didn't happen here. That's incredible. And I'm sure that quick incentive is one thing that is a component to the high satisfaction of the program, yeah, exactly. as you mentioned earlier, um, really keeping those customers happy. Well, um, thank you all so much for answering these questions, diving into more about the program. It's extremely helpful. Um, so just thank you all for sharing this information with everyone and talking about the program again. It, it you know, Truly a one of it, a one of a kind program, and um, sure we'll start to. Yep. And I know there was, it. yeah, I know there was probably a lot of questions that came in. I saw the, the chat and the Q and A was constantly popping up questions. Sorry, we don't have time to answer all of these on here, but you know, Judy or, or Rich, if you could send us the questions, Blake and I would be happy to respond to them. I think most of what we can respond to quickly. Um, you know, and then hopefully I can we can meet all of you guys at, at the next PLMA upcoming meetings and we can talk, you know, in detail more about this program. So happy to interact. Um, we don't want this project to be something cool that Rocky Mountain Power is doing it. We want you to leverage the lessons learned and the lessons that we're continuing to learn to, you know, scale this throughout the entire world. And that'll just that'll just help with this energy transition. That we're all trying to accomplish. Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you, Sean from Rocky Mountain Power, Blake Rochetta from Sonin Battery, and Meg Campbell from Guidehouse. Like what a what a really terrific conversation. I think we all learned an awful lot. To answer one of the questions that came up in, in the chat, you can see the uh, the video from Rocky Mountain Power. It is actually on their website. I checked, Sean. And uh, we will also be publishing this particular recording of the webinar on PLMA's YouTube channel. So it will be embedded there as well. Uh, uh, perhaps we can go to the next slide, please. All right. So as I just mentioned, we did record this session and you will be able to uh, see it on our YouTube channel as well as listen to it again on PLMA's podcast. And you can get a podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. So Apple, Google, wherever you wherever you get your podcasts, you can find this. It's called Peak Load Management uh, Dialogues. And uh, that is something that's always available. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we do have a YouTube channel. It's YouTube slash at PLMA DR. DR, of course, for demand response. We've got a whole lot of videos and recordings there for your, your benefit and use and enjoyment. Next slide. And to let you know about upcoming programs, we've just got a little bit of the month of December remaining. However, next week on December 7th, we are really excited to have our friends from USDOE's um, Department of uh, Loan Programs join us to talk a little bit about uh, virtual power plants, as well as financing sources for those. And you can register for that webinar. It's available to everybody, and it's on PLMA's calendar at the bottom, peakload.org slash calendar. Next slide, please. And following week, which is uh, December 14th, <laughs> we are inviting back our uh, our PLMA Women in Load Management um, group. That, this is one of PLMA's affinity groups, and they have been conducting a four-session series discussion around um, career development opportunities. So they are doing a wrap-up from their discussion and workshop that they held at the conference that's been mentioned that we just hosted in Charlotte. And they are also going to be doing some forward planning for the types of programs that folks would like to see from them coming up in 2024. So again, you can register on that, uh, peakload.org slash calendar. And this is open for PLMA members as well as anyone who was also at the conference. Next slide, please. Important reminder, if you have a great story to tell about DR, DERs, managed charging, flexible load, 
any of those subjects, we would love to hear about it. We have a call for presentations open right now for the 49th PLMA conference. Um, we're planning ahead of a ways, as you can imagine, these things take a bit of time to pull together, but that conference will be held next May in uh, Portland, Oregon, and you have until December 22nd to initiate a proposal for a presentation that uh, you believe would be worthy of uh, discussion at that conference, and we welcome everybody to bring in their, their proposals and uh, let's create a really great set of conference topics for everyone to enjoy together. And then last slide, thank you. And you have been uh, listening to a, no, let me make sure I've got the right slide here. You've been listening to a load management dialogue presented by PLMA. To learn about upcoming dialogues and for an archive of past recordings, please visit peakload.org or your favorite podcast platform. And this concludes this edition. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.